And to me, I've realized that in showbiz, there's two types of people. There's the person you come and tap them on the shoulder and you go, come on, son, you've had a good run, but you know, we know you're blagging and they go, oh, well, you got me and they go and they're the nice people. And then the ones you tap on and go, come on, off you go. And they go, what are you talking about? I'm a genius. And they're the cunts. Hey guys, it's Matt Haycox here and welcome to another episode of The Matt Haycox Show. And today I've got with me an award-winning TV comedian. He's a writer, he's a, he's, a, oh sorry, he's a travel writer, he's a writer, he's a podcaster, he's a journalist and he was catapulted into the mainstream back in 2000 with the hit TV show Trigger Happy TV where my next guest ultimately redefined what's probably become a staple of online comedy um, and you know, hidden camera genre of TV today. Uh, the show went on to be an absolute sellout, sold in 50 countries around the world, won numerous awards. Since then, he's had a hugely successful career that's seen him take on and excel at a diverse range of projects whilst appearing in some of the world's biggest TV shows. Fascinating career story. Welcome to the show, Dom Jolly. Thank you very much. That was a very exciting intro. <laughs> you've, got, you've got a lot to live up to. It made it sound like I had a plan, but don't. <laughs> I mean, I guess just going back to the beginning for you, you were, you were uh, born and, or grew up in Beirut. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what, what, what was that like in terms of uh, a childhood compared to what you would have imagined it would have been like in the UK? What were, what were your earliest memories? Well, it's one of the weird things. It's an amazing place to grow up. But because I got, there was a war started when I was seven, I got sent off to boarding school here. So I had a very schizophrenic upbringing. I had half my life was sort of at school with members of Radiohead and the future Tory cabinet. And then the other half would be in a war zone, but in an incredibly exciting, interesting country. So you'd go back in the school holidays to Lebanon, would you? Or? Yeah, so I'd literally sort of be in a war zone and then go and sort of write some quite interesting what I did in the holiday essays at school and stuff. And I think what it did, it made me very unsettled and it was quite frightening a lot of the time, but it also allowed me to kind of, I think, detach myself a little bit from things and be able to take an overview of things. So I've always felt like an outsider like because in Lebanon I was English but when I came here I was this weird guy that lived in Lebanon in a war zone so I've always slightly uh, been a slight outsider and I think that's helped in writing and in comedy because I sort of feel I can observe things quite a lot. I guess being split between the two what, what ultimately made your decision to be to be UK based and, uh, and not in Lebanon as opposed to the other I way I didn't around. make that decision uh, when I finished school my dad left my mum and we were dumped here so that was it. I mean, no offence, but it wasn't my choice. <laughs> I'd have gone somewhere hotter. Um, and and how, how would you have described yourself back then in terms of, uh, in terms of looking forward to your future career plans? I mean, you know, did, did you have a plan? You know, were you entrepreneurial? Were you a fan of comedy? No, so I'm financially just a mess. I'm just, business-wise, I'm just useless. I'm, that's been my biggest regret and everything I've done is just, I'm, I've made loads of cash and I've spent it all and uh, I'm just terrible at business. But I've had a lot of fun. And growing up, my dad ran a family company, which was a shipping agency uh, in Beirut. And I suppose technically, I, you know, he took it over from his dad. I suppose technically I was supposed to take it over, but I think he realized pretty early on that I was not the guy to do that. And I had no interest in it at all. So my sister took over that. So I used to think, well, what am I going to do? And when I was a kid in Lebanon, I looked around and the people that I really were ex was excited by were foreign correspondents, uh, spies and diplomats. They were like the three cool people. And I've been all three, or have I? I don't know, but I've certainly been two of them. Um, so I was a foreign correspondent for the Indy. I went off to the Olympics in Beijing, so I kind of ticked that box. I was a diplomat in Prague because I was an intern for the European Commission. So I, I kind of... It's weird, I kind of thought I was gonna have this quite serious job when I grew up. And when I left university from 20 till 30, I was, I was a diplomat, I worked at ITN, I was a producer in parliament. I did all this weird, quite serious stuff. And then suddenly I ended up dressing as a squirrel and actually was never happier. So I kind of flipped it around. Normally I think you do stupid stuff first and then you get more serious. I did serious stuff and then went, more stupid. But during your time of doing that serious stuff, I mean, did you have, I guess, did you have an interest or passion in comedy or, or, or did... Never had any interest. Well, I, mean, I watched comedy, but I didn't really have an interest in comedy. I grew up watching a lot of hidden camera stuff, weird stuff, early candid camera, things like a thing called Funny People, which is quite racist, but it was a kind of South African hidden camera show. And I used to really like it as a, as a form of comedy. It really appealed to me. But my real interest was politics, like uh, politics and travel. I was just like, 
I was a politics junkie, so that's why I was like working in Prague and then I worked in Parliament. And I didn't really think about it till I started realizing that if I really wanted to go for it at ITN, I needed to be absolutely dedicated and I'm just not that sort of person. So I started m messing about basically and I started setting stuff up in interviews on the green and I'd have an MP, I'd be interviewing, there'd be clowns fighting in the background. I'd get mates come around and do stuff. And in the end I was fired from ITN and replied to a job advert for what turned out to be a comedy show that I became a researcher on and that's how it happened. So it was a real sliding doors, like it could have total as in, luck. As in you became a researcher on Trigger Happy? No, no. I went, I got a job, there was a show called Mark Thomas Comedy Product and Mark Thomas was a sort of very political comedian and because I'd been working in Parliament they needed a researcher who could set up MPs who knew their way around politics. So I thought I was going for like a documentary job or something, went in there and then day one we had to drive a drive a tank and a clown car through McDonald's drive throughs and stuff. And I was like, I can't believe you're paid to do this. And I thought I can do this. And so I did that show. And then I went to Paramount Comedy Channel as a producer. And then I just started doing my own stuff. And that eventually turned into Trigger Happy and Trigger Happy went off. But I mean, it was very weird. There was no plan. So, so let's talk, talk a little bit about Trigger Happy. I mean, and I guess also for the for the younger viewers uh, or, or listeners, just, just describe a, a bit about the format and... Well, there was no format to Trigger Happy, really. I, I suppose my problem, I grew up watching a lot of Hidden Camera. I loved Hidden Camera. But it was either, basically in comedy, Hidden Camera and pranks are seen as the lowest form of intelligence, basically. If you're smart in comedy, you write sitcoms, you go off and, you know, you become a very smart stand-up or whatever. And I just loved this format. I thought it was incredible. Like, it was all about improvisation. It was making stuff up. There was real adrenaline in that you had to approach the public and try and be funny either in character or in costume. And, you know, Hidden Camera in itself is a really interesting concept. It was the first show that made the public the star. It was the first reality show. Candid Camera was the first reality show. So I kind of thought, I'm pretty smart. I want to be a smart person in a stupid format, really. I didn't think about it. I just thought, why is this format, which I think can be beautiful and amazing and funny, why is it always naff? And it's like Beatles are bad and people are sort of, it's just naff. So I just wanted to make a show that was cool. So. I ended up making the show with a friend and it kind of, there was no plan. We just went off and started filming and kept filming. I, I sort of hate analyzing comedy really, but essentially it was, it was a prank show, but it was a cool prank show with an amazing soundtrack and it was quite dark. And how did it come to be on the TV? Is it something you created and picked? Because or? I was, I started to make little stuff at Paramount Comedy Channel. There was a marketing man there and Paramount Comedy Channel obviously sells comedy and he spent 200 grand a year putting ads in newspapers and stuff saying Paramount Comedy Channel's funny. And he suddenly saw the sort of stuff I was doing and he said, well, why don't you just try and get in the headlines? And if it's funny, that would be a great advert for Paramount Comedy Channel. So I started stalking politicians and I sent strippers to William Hague's, uh, William Hague's engagement party. I kidnapped the Tory chicken. I put a fake Millennium Dome in Peter Mandelson's garden and all these things. And we'd take a paparazzi with us. He'd get the pictures. And then we had the front page of The Guardian, like, you know, Paramount Comedy Channel. So that did really well. So I started making this stuff. And then Channel 4 got wind of it because it, it my stuff started going out in between the shows that went out on Paramount Comedy Channel, like Friends and Frasier. It'd be little three-minute segments. And it got quite cool. And bands used to watch it. Oasis used to watch it. And it got quite culty. And then there was a thing called Comedy Lab, which was basically anyone that hadn't made a TV show before could apply to do it. So I went to Channel 4 and said, this is what I want to do. Um, and the woman who I spoke to had just been making Brass Eye. And so she, with Chris Morris, which was an amazing show, and she'd just been in court for like two years. And she was like, I can't have someone do political stuff. Can you not just do funny stuff? Like no agenda. And that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because rather than trying to show everyone how smart I was and I wanted to do this political stuff, it was just like, you know what, just whatever's funny, do it. So I made a little 15 minute pilot that went out, got amazing reviews and then we got a series and then it went out on Friday, Saturday night at 10.30. It was just insane. I mean, when I listen to you telling these stories, I mean, it's quite clear to me how, how much, you know, you, you clearly loved what you did back then. That was and, the uh, best thing I've ever done. And it's the, you know, it's the thing, it's the thing I've learned the most, obviously, if you're just passionate about something and you just love it. I mean, the idea that someone had given me money, to just go off and make a TV show. Uh, and I could just do whatever I wanted. I was in charge of it. We were directing it, we edited it. I chose all the music, just the whole thing. And so for two, three years, I was literally living the dream. Went off and did it, absolutely loved it. 
And it was incredible. And you wonder why, I mean, why doesn't everyone do that all the time? I mean, do you think it was a turning point for you in that from, you kind of learnt then that, you know, I'm being successful at this because I love it and I'm passionate about it and that's what my future is going to look like? Or, or do, you think you'd always, do you think you'd always only done what you loved anyway? No, I'd always known that I just didn't fit into jobs, like normal jobs. I couldn't be nine to five. I refused to wear a suit, didn't like getting up early. I was not interested in business. And my problem was I just didn't know what it was that I, I could do. And, and that's, I think, one of the great secrets of people I'm really jealous of in life are people that know what they want to do really early on because then they can focus on it and go for it. On the other hand, having said that, I love the fact that I didn't know what I want to do because most comedians start at 18 with very little hinterland, like no background really. They're quite focused on their, they're quite just in on their comedy. Whereas I'd done so many weird things that when I got to trigger happy, I could bring all that into it because it's about having, you know, it's why MPs, for instance, I don't think should be MPs at 22 or whatever. MPs shouldn't be MPs, they're 45. They should have done proper jobs. They should have done proper stuff so that when they come in, they've actually got real life experience and stuff and bring different stuff in. Well, I was going to say, I think yeah, I would probably argue that the people who you know, know what they want to do from a very young age probably only you know, know that because, like you said, you know, they haven't got I agree, experience. their dad's a doctor, maybe there's a doctor. I yeah. mean, occasionally, I mean, my daughter's a great example. She's, you know, my wife's a sculptor. I'm a squirrel. She is a maths genius. <laughs> a sculpting squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but basically we're both sort of creative. My daughter just loves maths, got obsessed with it. She got into Oxford. She's reading neuroscience. She knew she wanted to do neuroscience. Who the hell thinks, I want to do neuroscience? Where does that come from? And she knew she wanted to do that when she was 16. So that, to me, is amazing because it's nothing to do with us, trust me. So I haven't pushed her into doing neuroscience. But that is a rare thing. I, I agree with you. People that... But on the other hand, it, somehow it makes life easier as well because I did spend a lot of time wasting my time doing lots of stuff. But in hindsight, maybe I didn't waste time because it's all experience. It's all interesting. Wow. Do you know what I mean? But I, I, I suppose what, what I'm aware of is this thing called the 10,000-hour mm -hmm. uh, theory, which um, I think was written by a... Uh, Matthew Said, I think, wrote it, who's a, a sports writer for the Times. And the concept, I'm sure you know it, is, is that to be really, really good at something, you need to spend a minimum of 10,000 hours. So Matthew Said was a ping pong player. Like He just used to play ping pong when he was a kid with his dad, and he ended up playing ping pong for England. For England. Violinists have that same thing. Yeah. And that's a sort of dedication to a thing that is amazing. And you realise if you are going to spend that much time at something, you're probably going to get really, really good at it. I just get bored at doing like the same thing, but in a funny way, because I had to spend so much time making trigger happies. Each trigger happy series took a year. Uh, I probably did spend 10,000 hours doing hidden camera and I nailed it and I got it really good, but I'm like, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do something else. You used to take a whole year? Oh yeah. As, as, in, as in literally like- <laughs> One of the joys day. of trigger happy, the reason trigger happy is so good compared to a lot of hidden camera shows is because a normal show, you basically get given a budget, uh, you have to, hire a cameraman, no offense, sound man. They're expensive, <laughs> they're lazy, they want coffee breaks, all that shit. Oh, he's, he's a good lad, this one. Trigger Happy <laughs> happened right on the cusp. It was a bit like punk. It was like the moment when, to be a musician, you had to either have been to the Royal Academy or you, know, you had to have all these expensive guitars and suddenly punk happened. And it was like, you just pick up a guitar, get in your garage and just play a song. It didn't matter. And that was really liberating for everyone. With Trigger Happy, what happened, it was a bit like the advent just before YouTube. Before, about a year before I made Trigger Happy, you had to get you know, a proper cameraman with a proper camera. Suddenly this camera came out called the VX1000 and it was the first camera, you could buy it for a grand. That, I mean, looking back, the quality is just so shit, it's incredible, but it was good enough to put on telly. And so we bought this thing and then rented it back to the production. And it just meant, so it was me, Sam, a, a camera and a radio mic and we just went off and that's it and so normally when you make a show they're like right we've got a three-week shooting schedule try and get what you can in that and then you just take the best of that we just kept filming because we had no costs it was just me sam and the camera and we just kept going and we got so much better at it we made so much shit it was incredible we got so many unfunny things but slowly we started to realize what worked what didn't and it was really learning on the job so it was a unique opportunity like who the fuck gets a chance to have a whole year of television like learning to do it normally your first album is like what you've been doing your whole life and then the second album is like fuck i'm on tour 
you know. I mean, you, using that kind of logic and example you just spoken about then, and I guess projecting forward to 20, 20 years now, yeah. where where there's even more avail availability of, of cameras and cheap equipment, you know, to, to the fact that you know you you could, you could arguably make a movie on an iPhone now. You absolutely could, yeah. I mean, do, do you do you think that? Um, and and obviously, you know, prank style comedy is prolific prolific across the internet. It is. Um, do, do you do you think that's that's a good thing or a bad thing for for, for that genre? Um, and obviously, it's created some crap as well. But you know, yeah, you a think, lot of crap. Do you think the avail availability of it is is ultimately a better thing? Because I guess your crap just didn't get seen because you accepted it was crap and you and and you. Um, you well, to be you, fair, you, I think a lot. Bit. I think probably a lot of YouTubers, you know, they film stuff and if it's shit, they don't put it out. You know, so I think they still some of them clearly don't. But you know, most of them have an edit thing. But I think what was. I think what's different for me was, you know, literally, I sort of feel like I'm talking about Victorian times now, but there were like five channels, you know, and Channel 4, Friday night, it's what you watched, mm. really. And so the one thing I think I had, or something like Trigger Happy had over YouTubers, is that water cooler moment, that moment when you go out on a Friday night, a Saturday night, and then everyone's at school on Monday morning, they're like, oh, did you see that? You know, whereas now when you have something that works on YouTube or something goes viral, everyone sees it at a slightly different time. So you don't have that kind of, moment where everyone gels and, and I was lucky with that uh, the first week after Trigger Happy went out I had no idea it was gonna be a hit yeah I was just so proud of it and I just couldn't believe her on telly and we were between friends and Frasier and I got on a train on a, it had gone out on the Saturday night I got on a train on the Tuesday I can't remember where I was going and that ringtone went off and three people on the train didn't know I was there stood up and went hello I'm on the train I was like what the fuck it's just <laughs> so that was a very weird weird moment if YouTube and stuff had existed um, when I was making Trigger Happy, so five years later, I would have probably ended up being a Remy Gaillard who nicked all my stuff and, and went onto YouTube and, and did a lot of my sort of stuff and got a billion hits. Uh, you know, the, the joy of YouTube is you can just make your stuff, put it out, and it's going to the world straight away. Owning your stuff is much more difficult with that. I kind of love the traditional... You know, I went to Channel 4, got it, it felt grown up, I was with the big kids, and then I was in an edit, and I really took ages editing, so I, I loved every second of it. So, but, but to get back to your question about what pranks are on YouTube now, there's a lot of shit. There's a lot of stuff that, what really annoys me is it's faked. I can spot it a mile off, because hidden camera is difficult, and people take the easy routes, there's lots of fake, but there is also... Occasionally I come across something and it's absolutely amazing. It is interesting that Hidden Camera, when I did it, was a kind of dead format really. It kind of, uh, it was naff, it, no one took it seriously. And then with the advent of the internet, Hidden Camera is now by far the biggest comedy form in the world. It's crazy. If you think about it, it doesn't even have its own awards. It doesn't really, you know, you see all this stuff from Russia and South America because everyone's doing it. And you don't even know who these people are. And there's something really interesting about that. So Channel 4, a few years after that, uh, I believe the BBC came along and, uh, and poached you. Well, this is my first big mistake. So <clears throat> the one thing I've learned, uh, I think my most, I think the thing I'd pass on to someone most is never, ever make a decision when you've just finished doing something. Like I used to be so wiped emotionally, mentally knackered after doing a trigger happy because there's a lot of adrenaline and you're every day you're approaching someone and you don't think it's going to work. So you're just going on up and down. And basically when I'd finish editing a trigger happy, I'd just be gone. Like I'd just be in bed for two weeks. And after the second trigger happy TV had finished second series, it was massive. We won lots of awards. I kind of thought, Oh, it's not going to get better than this. And I wanted to treat it a bit like a band, you know, who just left at the top. So I thought, right, that's it. I'm going to, I'm going to finish. And, uh, and Channel 4 said, no, 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 we'd like you just to make more series. And I went, nah, I'm not going to. And they offered me a vast amount of money. So I made two Christmas specials. And then the BBC approached me and said, do you want to come away? And it doesn't matter what you do with the BBC. We're not interested in ratings. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, come away. So I kind of did. And I'm, it was the biggest mistake I ever made. Because I, I basically, what I should have done, I just at the time, I just didn't want to do Trigger Happy. I was bored. I wanted to do something completely different. Uh, but what I should have done is, I think you're really lucky when you've got a golden goose, when you've laid something or made something that's really good. And I'd crafted it for so long. Uh, you don't just kick it on the wayside. What I should have done is just done one every four years and done all my weird stuff in between. As it was, I just, I kind of broke up the band and just said, right, that's it. I'm going on somewhere else. 
So, I mean, it was, it was interesting and brilliant, but God, stupid. And I guess if we went back to that time and because uh, we were talking about YouTube, YouTube a moment ago, uh, I mean, if, if YouTube would have been around back then, do, do you think that's something that you may have gone to in, gone into yourself? And, you know, do you think you would have done you know, the, the mega numbers of some of the some of the pranksters of today? So, yes, I would have got mega numbers because, I mean, Trigger Happy, if you think about the format of Trigger Happy and the way it is, it's just so ideally suited to either work as a program or to pull out as little modules and just put them in as hits. So it would work perfectly. Mm -hmm. Problem is, I am just so disorganized and so crap at business that I would have put all my stuff up on YouTube and got a billion hits and made no money from it. And some other bastard would have nicked it or done something. And I'm just useless at that sort of thing. Even when we were making Trigger Happy, Sam and I were just, we had this sort of punk ethos, really. We weren't really interested in, uh, oh God. Sorry, that's very loud. Um, <laughs> We had a sort of punk ethos, really. It was kind of like we weren't doing it for cash. I mean, we were being paid really nicely. and It was really exciting and we were making lots of cash, but we were doing it just, honestly, we called it for the beauty. We were doing it because we fucking loved it. It was amazing being paid to do the thing you absolutely loved. And the fact that everyone else liked it as well was a bonus. So we did things like, I mean, everyone was saying, oh, we need to get ringtones and we'll sell the ringtones. And we we're like, what? No, of course we won't. And then people started selling Trig Happy ringtones and we're making, someone came to us and said, we want to do Trig Happy fruit machines. I go, you fucking mental. There were Trig Happy fruit machines. So someone made loads of cash and it wasn't me. And I, I'd, I'd like, in hindsight, I should have married a business manager, I think. Well, I was, I was going to say I mean, that there's been multiple times during this conversation now that, you, that, that you've made reference to, you know, not being, not being great at business or to... Well, it's only because I've got to the age now, 53, where I think, fuck, I've just always assumed that I could just wing my way out of everything because like whenever anything else starts I just do something else but I think just because I've just turned 53 I'm feeling very mortal at the moment and I just think I've got no pension I've got no uh, you know I've got nothing to fall back on apart from my wits and and what I do and, and I'm just slightly aware that I could get to an age where the wits go and that is quite frightening the good side of it however because for instance I spent I made a lot of money and I spent 10 years I spent probably from about 2008 2018 doing fuck all because I I just went traveling and became a travel writer, but I financed it myself. I loved it. I had a great time, put my kids through school, but I've spent all my money now. And actually that's a terrifying thing, but it's also brilliant because what you realize is you, you look at people who make a great album and then suddenly they make a really shit album. You go, what happened? And he goes, well, they had kids and they just sort of, they're sitting at home and they're not really making much inspirational art. And there's nothing that makes you create and make good stuff better than hunger and fear and that's that's what I've got right now well I was gonna say because it's interesting talking to you about it and you know despite the fact that on the one hand you're saying you know I'm I'm 50 I've hit 53 I'm feeling mortal thinking you know you know has my money run out but at the same at the same token so in the same breath you don't sound like there's there's any regrets at all for the fact that that it has run out because I, I don't think you think you would be who you are today without it and yeah well that's true but i could have you know there's a couple of things like you know, <laughs> I, 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 I could have, i could have hung on to my house in notting hill and not sold it 15 years ago you know because every three years some fucker sends me how much it's worth now and things like that but um no i mean there's a couple of stupid decisions but then what i love is i've got a wife who's canadian she's much more grounded than i am and you know whenever i I suddenly wake up and go, fuck, why did I sell that? Or why didn't I do that or whatever? Have you got some yeah. utterly ludicrous purchases that spring to mind? Oh my God, I bought a biplane once. I bought a plane, I can't even fly. I bought a hot <laughs> air balloon. I, An uh, actual hot air balloon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What the hell did you do with it? I flew, I, t I learned to flirt the, the balloon, the hot air, the world hot air balloon champion taught me to fly. <laughs> I really like hot air ballooning actually, so that was all right. But the biplane was fucking ridiculous. What was that about? <laughs> it just sat in my field for ages and then that that was a bit stupid but i've got a uh, a wife who's canadian and she's much more grounded than i am and she just basically every time i wake up in a sweat just go why did i do that she goes yeah but if we hadn't done that you know like if we hadn't sold london then we wouldn't be in the you know what i mean it's all like all these things are for a reason so it's just occasionally i think oh i should be a bit more responsible that's all no i i, I get exactly i'll tell you what annoys me being english there's some twat I went to school with who's, I mean, I'm not thinking of anyone in particular, but who's the thickest, dullest moron in the world. And he bought a house in London in 1989 and he's just sat in it since then. 
and he's way more loaded than I am by doing fuck all, and that's what irritates me. But <laughs> I, I guess he's just been sat in that house doing nothing with no stories to tell, and you've got, you, you might not have the house, but you've got 20, 20 years of life, life on him, haven't you? But why not have the house as well? Wouldn't that be good? Yeah, well, it'd, be, yeah. Yeah, it'd be great to have it yeah, all. Yeah. But no, because I, I, I do, yeah, very no, I'm, I'm, uh, you've caught me on a very bad day just because it is, just because I have just <laughs> had you my. Slept bad. No, well, yeah, and I just had my 53rd birthday, and it was, it was weird actually. 50 didn't bother me at all. For some reason, 53rd, I think it was the first birthday, I genuinely couldn't remember how old I was. And then I was quite shocked when I found out. So, uh, yeah, it, 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 I did have a bit of a mortal moment I'm, in the last I'm, couple I'm of weeks. I'm 40 next month. I'm, I'm feeling oh, like, fuck like, yourself. like, like so my happy. life crisis yeah, is yeah. coming. <laughs> but no, I mean, I was going to say, you know, I think like you as well in that, I, you know, I sometimes look back at some of the, you know, well, not sometimes, I often look back and think, fucking hell, if I added up all those bits of shit that, you know, oh, yeah. th th that I've bought, you know, I could have this. But then I also, I don't, whether... Oh, I never regret buying anything, like, because <laughs> you buy something because it's fun. What's the point of having money if you don't do that? Well, that, but it's just I, stupid, I panicky decisions. That's but then I, I also hate. think, and I, I don't know if I'm just saying it to justify it to myself, but I, I kind of don't believe I am. I, I think that you know, if you hadn't had those moments, if you hadn't done those things, you know, A wouldn't have led to B, wouldn't have led to C. It's sliding I, doors, I isn't it? I mean, like I today. totally agree with that. I mean, I can think of, you know, I can think of, I, I can think of, I mean, everything's a sliding door. It's that butterfly effect. When does something affect something else? But I can think of three or four moments that if I'd gone left rather than right, None of it would happen, you know. I'd, I'd answered an ad in the Guardian. Who the fuck answers ads in the Guardian? They read the Guardian, which said, "Do you have a sense of humour?" And that's how I got my job in Paramount Comedy. That's how I got, you know, all those weird things. I met Sam, the guy I made Trigger Happy with, and I wouldn't have been able to make it without him. I got this offer by Paramount to go and film stuff, but I didn't have a cameraman, and I went with my girlfriend to a pub called The Engineer in. Uh, Primrose Hill, and I'm sitting there going, "It's fucking incredible." I've got, you know, they've literally said, "Just go and film stuff," but. I, you know, I can't afford a cameraman. The barman suddenly says, I can do that. He leans over and I go, are you serious? He goes, yeah, yeah, I'm a cameraman. So I said, we'll turn up Paramount on Monday and we'll try you out. And he was an artist. He'd never done camera at all, but he just, he's a bit on the spectrum. So he kind of read the entire handbook of the camera he had turned up and was so different. He's like the most organized, driven together guy. He used to be a runner and he used to have a belt with everything on it. And he's He's the sort of guy that alphabetizes his books and all his CDs are in color coding, whereas I'm the complete opposite. And I think we worked brilliantly because of that. We were kind of, we clashed slightly. So there was always a bit of tension. There's a bit like an Oasis vibe going on, but also because we complemented each other. So it was really good. And we had exactly the same sense of humor. I mean, you spoke a moment ago about uh, you know great work coming from hunger. Yeah. Uh, and again, yeah, I I, uh, I would 100% agree with you. I, I know, uh, whilst I've never done it in an artistic or, or or comedic sense, I know that a lot of my you know best deals have, have been done when my back's been up against a wall. Yeah. Um, and that you know there's been times or or there's times when let's say I've got more cash around me that I just don't fight you know fight as hard hard for the you know for the for the pounds in the next deal. Uh, and I completely agree with with the concept of what you're saying. I mean, how would you go about uh, advising someone, you know, how to find their hunger and how, how, how to maintain hunger when, you know, I guess you aren't hunger, hungry? <laughs> Sell your house in London. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? You have to bankrupt yourself, spend all your money, uh, just have a great time. I mean, I, I kind of, I very much have that carpe diem, seize the day thing as well, because I'm like, you know, you could save and, put everything and have a lovely pension and stuff and then get run over by a bus when you're 55. So I've always thought, you know, just go for it. So I've had an incredible, from the moment Trigger Happy's happened, I've, I've been to 100 countries, I've taken my kids around the world, driven to Istanbul and back, done these weirdest things, written these weird books, done weird shows. I've just not regretted a second of it. I've had a fantastic time, lived in amazing places, got lovely house and stuff. But uh, you just think when you when you get to that stage, uh, when you're when you're sort of comfortable, you kind of think I'm I'm basically lazy. It's quite odd. I'm I'm a sort of restless, lazy person, which is quite odd. So basically, I, if if I don't have to work, I don't want to work. I want to just go and well, maybe that is work to some people. But for me, what I love doing is travel. I'm a travel writer. Now. I've written three travel books. I'm just about to write another one. For me, my happiness is just right. I've got three weeks to get on a plane, go somewhere weird, go to Burma, go to Laos, go to Libya and just wander around and write about it. That's what I love doing. Are they profitable pursuits for you now? Then? Cause I <laughs> no. know earlier on you said you kind of self-funded your travel travel career. Have you now managed to make it pay for itself? In any oh, they way? always paid. I mean, when I started off, I was writing for the Sunday Times and the Sunday Times paid really well. 
Mail on Sunday paid really well. And so I'd say, well, I want to go there. And they'd sort out the flood. That was all paid for. But I mean, compared to mega comedy hit, it's not the same money. And then I wrote a book called The Dark Tourist, which Netflix stole um, and made a show of. But my book did really well, sold really well, translated to lots of languages. And, you know, I got paid fine. If I'd have been told when I was 18, I'd be paid that for writing a book, I'd be very happy. But after the money you make from things like hit TV shows, it's not quite the same. So, uh, so yeah, so this is the irony, really, is that when you're a kid or when you're young, when you're 20 and you're single and you're living in a shitty flat, you don't care. Uh, and basically, you're not doing stuff for the money. I mean, you want the money, but you're doing stuff. The only thing I'm good at is things I absolutely love and I'm passionate about. And so you just do that and you do things for the right reasons and you do it and success kind of comes with that. But the problem is that once you then set up a lifestyle and you have kids and they're going to schools and you've got a wife, it's very difficult for you to keep that kind of, hey, I'm just, I don't care. I'm just going to do stuff just because it's the right thing to do. You think, shit, you know, I've got to pay the rent, basically. You know, that's, uh, Caitlin Moran said it once. It's like, why do people do stuff like that? You know, why do people do ads? It's like, bitch, got to pay rent, you know. And, and you start having responsibilities. So it's very difficult to be a hungry, uh, cutting edge creative when you've got a wife and two kids and two Labradors. You know, it's much easier if you're, if you're single. T tell me about uh, some of your travel journeys. I mean, I mean you, you must have been to some incredible places, you know, seen some mad stuff. I mean, what, what's one or two, you know, gr crazy stories that spring to mind? Uh, well, my first book, Dark Tourist, I went on holidays to places you wouldn't normally go on holiday to. So I went on a package tour of North Korea, a coach trip around North Korea. On your uh, own? No. The only people that can go into North Korea are government approved tourists. And the only people that want to go to North Korea are kind of really hardened travellers who want to kind of tick it off because it's not a nice place. Uh, but it's fascinating. And so you end up with 30 very independent travellers whose idea of hell is a coach trip on a coach are being driven around North Korea and on this what should be the world's dullest tour you know like the first day we went to the Museum of Agricultural Scythes and Lathes followed by a visit to the dear leader's mother's tomb but because you're in North Korea it's just amazing everything about it is totally weird you go to a golf course there's a nine-hole golf course in the middle of Pyongyang you turn up and there's a there's a ball like in a glass box and you go, what's that? And they go, oh, the dear leader came here. He'd never played golf before. And guess what? I go, I think I know. Did he get nine <laughs> holes in one? And they go, yes, he did. Like that. <laughs> and you're like, for fuck's sake. So it's just like this one. It's like this massive cult place. And I suppose what I like about travel is in the old days, my mum always used to say to me, we're not tourists, we're travellers. Like travel is about going somewhere to really push your comfort zones to get something different. And now like the world's so homogenized, like almost everywhere you go, there's a Starbucks 100 meters away. It's very difficult to really get out of it unless you go to these places that are either run by awful dictators or there is a war on. And so that's what I did. So I went to North Korea. I went to Chernobyl for the weekend, which was interesting. I went skiing in Iran. I saw a picture of a woman in full Shador skiing. And I said, where's that? And someone said, that's Iran. So I went to Tehran and then went up and it was amazing. Like they have a big fence up the middle women skiing on one side, men on the other. But then when you get to the top, everyone's just mixing and having fun. I go, how come up there? And they go, mullahs don't snowboard. So all the mullahs are at the bottom. So they had a great, so Iran was amazing. I went to Cambodia. I ended up at a war crimes trial in, in Phnom Penh, which was just extraordinary. I was reading about this guy called Duch, who was like one of the worst People in the Khmer Rouge and he used to smash babies' heads I against the you, wall I and stuff. You meant you were the um, you were being prosecuted. No, I was not being prosecuted. No, <laughs> in a war crimes trial. But anyway, I blagged my way into a war crimes trial, which was really weird, uh, and that was one of the weirdest moments I've ever seen because this guy I'd read a book about him weirdly before I'd been to Cambodia, and then as I got there, I found out that he was being he was on trial, and I made a press card and I got into the war crimes trial. Well, actually I got in and then they booted me out because I was wearing shorts. <laughs> so I'd blag my way in and then I couldn't get in because I was wearing shorts. So I had to go outside and take a Cambodian guard, buy a Cambodian guard's trousers. And he was about a fifth the size of me. So I was sort of <laughs> squeezing them on. But anyway, I went in. But what was amazing about it is this guy, he was part of the Khmer Rouge that ran uh, Cambodia and basically took the place back to the Stone Age. They killed over two million people. They killed all the intellectuals. And this particular guy, I'd never read more disgusting things this guy had done. He'd picked up babies and smashed them against a wall. He'd like 
shot families. I mean, just an appalling human being. And he'd been caught and he was being put in this war crime. So you go in there and you think you're going to see this utter monster, like ogre. And then there's this guy just sitting there and he just, just looks like an accountant, like a really, really dull man. And, and it, it's, there's a guy called Adolf Eichmann who was a Nazi who escaped to Argentina and the Israelis kidnapped him and brought him back to Tel Aviv to uh, a trial. And he again looked like an accountant. And there was a phrase, the banality of evil, which is incredible. Because you kind of assume these people are monsters. Mm. And then you look at them, you think, no, these are just dull motherfuckers like any of us. That was an incredible thing to do. Oh, oh, have you got some places on your list that you've uh, still not been to? I mean, yeah, I've got loads. So I've got, uh, I walked across Lebanon last year for my new book, my last book, um, from the Israeli border. I walked 30 days across the mountains to the Syrian border. Um, and I want to do another walk, but the places I want to go to, I'm banned from at the moment. I'm banned from Libya, and I really want to go to Libya because I wrote something about Libya in the Sunday Times, and so I can't get a visa. And I want to go to Algeria, I'm obsessed with. I want to go to Yemen. Um, and I want to go to Turkmenistan. The Turkmenistan is, was run by this guy, a leader who just is the ultimate in bling. He built, I think, a hundred foot gold statue of himself in the middle of the, of the capital. And the statue revolves to follow the sun. He changed the name of all the days of the week to that of his kids. Uh, I mean, he doesn't fuck about it. It's like proper <laughs> mental. And then if you go, Turkmenistan has massive gas reserves. So if you drive out into the desert, there's a place called the Gates of Hell, and it's this massive crater, and it's just gas coming up, a light, and you can right. camp by that, so that's where I want to go. Do you, do you do these on your own? I mean, maybe with other travellers, or do you, do you take your wife as well? No, on these ones, when I'm travel writing, I, write, I go on my own. I really like travelling on my own. I like my own company. But also, if you go with someone, you're chatting to them. You just have a normal out, time. Or yeah. if you go on a telly show, you're talking to the cameraman. If you go on your own... You're, you, you, you get so bored, you go and get in trouble, but also you, people watch. You know, I just love it. You, I think if you're, you're going to travel right, you have to go on your own. I really enjoy getting my own anyway. That's my excuse I tell my wife. <laughs> I'm working, darling. Yeah. To, talk to me a little bit about anxiety. You, you've, you've, you've spoken about it in, in the past inso, insofar as it's you know, something that, you, that you've suffered from. I mean, what's, what's been your experiences? Well, when I uh, left school and my parents divorced, and then, so obviously that was pretty traumatic, but I, it didn't hit me at the time. And then I went off interrailing, I went around Europe. And I remember I woke up one morning in Rome, in a hotel with my girlfriend, and she said, what's that? And I had a spot under my, under my, in my armpit, which turned out to be a heat rash. And I literally just, I, 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 I just went mental. I just got obsessed with it. I thought there was something terribly wrong. Thought I had cancer, went to a hotel. I went to a hospital just had what I now know were just like terrible panic attacks, but I had no idea what was going on. I thought I was going mad. I felt like I was having an out of body experience. I was sort of almost detached from myself. I was almost watching myself doing it. It was really terrifying. It was like having a bad acid trip without knowing you're taking acid. And I came home and I had a really bad year um, where it was depression and anxiety and I had panic attacks and I didn't really know what to do about it. And I think part of that must have been some sort of post-traumatic stress from growing up in a war where, you know, my family were very British. My dad would like, we'd be being shelled and we'd be in the basement. My dad would stay in his room at the top. He's kind of like stiff upper lip. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, I mean, you're not impressing a rocket. Do you know what I mean? So I think I had a lot of that stress going on and that probably was a release with it. And then nothing happened. When you say uh, you didn't know what to do, I mean, were, were you taking? Well, I went. Were you to, I, anyone? I went. I went to a doctor. I went to a GP. I went to some guy who gave me beta blockers. I went to someone else who uh, said that I needed to be in sedated. You know, all this shit I knew wasn't what I needed. And then someone else said, "Come on, let's talk about your childhood." And I go, "No, I'm fine with that. That's not what I need." And then I found someone who did cognitive therapy, which basically just taught me techniques of. When you're having a panic attack, you know, breathe into a bag and stuff like that. So I started to understand what I'm much more practical like that rather than like looking into stuff. So I kind of knew what it was. Anyway, it went away and things were fine. And then weirdly, when I started making Trigger Happy and I just I got to 30 and I'd finally found something I could do and I was good at it. I knew it. And I would got a fucking Channel 4 show. It was amazing. And we were filming it and I knew it was good. And we were about four weeks in. And I remember we were doing this, this weird, uh, I was a Dutch tourist 
so I had a big hat and a stupid thing and I had a guidebook which I just made up stuff and I was outside Sloan Square Tube and we stopped a cab and I said hello please uh, excuse me my egg must be boiled he goes what I go how long until the doctor comes for the egg and the guy's like what and I go eh. so I'm just reading this shit and then I suddenly just turn around to Sam and I go Sam I'm not feeling good he goes is this part of the joke because he never knew when I was like oh, no, 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 I'm not feeling good and I just walked off and I went home and that's it. I didn't come back for three weeks. I had massive, massive panic attacks. And I sat there thinking, I can't fucking believe it. Like, I've just finally got to where I want and it's all going to go when I finally got rung up. They've been really understanding. But the Dutch company rang up and said, look, the insurance is saying if you don't come back tomorrow, they're going to close it. And I thought, I can't believe that this thing, this black dog is going to kill my, what I'm going to do. So anyway, I forced myself back. And thank fuck, I was all right, and it managed it. But that was really terrifying. So then I thought, right, I need to do something about it. So I thought I could either do a long period of self-reflection and therapy and take up yoga, or I could take antidepressants. So I took antidepressants, and I've been on them ever since, and I've never had it again. Oh, really? Yeah. But what, as in, you, you, take, you take them continually, or just... Yeah, well, when I took them, the problem with antidepressants, they're like, they're, ser they're SSRIs. So basically, the way I've... The way I've sort of figured it out for myself is that I have a serotonin deficiency and that's what gives me depression and anxiety. And so basically it's very simple. It's like when you dip under your serotonin level, you get it. And these things replace serotonin. But the problem with them is that if you take them, if, you're, if I started having an anxiety attack now and I'm starting to feel bad and I think, right, I need to take them, they take two weeks to kick in because you have to build them up. And that's terrifying. So actually, in the end, I did that and then stopped and did that and stopped. And in the end, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to keep a constant. So now I take a tiny, tiny amount, like a 5G. I'm, I used to take 20G when it was really bad. Now I just take 5G every day and it just keeps me on a level. So I don't know what it's done to me. but Do, 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 do you find side effects from them? Uh, yeah, occasionally. I th I've got very, uh, I don't know, it's very odd. Part of me thought, fuck, it's this madness in me that that occasionally allows me to do something amazing. And it terrified me of the idea of getting balanced and uh, of feeling, because, you know, I'd become someone that was just, you know, I'd become an accountant. And I think part of being creative, unfortunately, is it's kind of like a weird pact. I think you can, if, you're, if you have weird stuff going on in your head, sometimes it allows you to reach really weird, amazing, creative areas. But the flip side of it, is that you have bad ones, you know, like you have, you can't have one without the other. And I think that's a pact you have to sort of accept, or you can just be middle of the road, bit dull, but no extremes. And I'm extremes. So yes, ch change, change of, uh, change of avenue. That was cheery. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I love I, listening to depressed clowns. <laughs> I really do. It's great. Um, let, let's let's kind of come back to the present day and 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 look at some some of the projects you, you do now or you look at now. I mean, how how do you choose what you do? I mean, do you get pitched a lot of stuff all the time? Do, I mean, I, I know we've talked about the fact that you. I don't know, get you pitched do anything at all. I um, I've done nothing for ten years. I mean, I, I went off and wrote travel books, and I've loved that. Travel books done really well, but comedy wise, I just stopped. And so I'm I I think people just think I've retired or I'm over the hill or I'm finished, and I kind of was. Talk about your books, by the way. You, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, Netflix stole one of your books. Yeah, so my first travel book is called The Dark Tourist, where I went off these weird holidays. And then some producer I know in America <clears throat> said, this is a great book, make a great TV series. And I said, good, because I wanted to write it as a book first, but I'd love to go make it as a TV series now. And she said, I think Netflix will like it. And so we went to Netflix and we pitched it in America. And they loved it. And then we never heard from them again. And then a year later, I find out that Netflix are making a show called not The Dark Tourist, but Dark Tourist with this twat from New Zealand who basically went to all the places I went to. Anyway, that's showbiz, but it was fucking annoying. So then I wrote a book. Then I decided I was going to be a monster hunter because um, I grew up on Tintin and I love the idea of the Yeti and stuff like that. So I wrote a book called Scary Monsters and Super Creeps. And I went, I went to Everest Base Camp looking for the Yeti. I went Northern California looking for Bigfoot. I went to Japan looking for this weird radioactive monster. I went to Canada where they have a, uh, a monster called Ogopogo who's like their Loch Ness. And I kind of knew it was a bit of a shit book because if I had found the Yeti, 
and I came back and I told everyone I found the Yeti. Everyone was like, yeah, Dom Jolly's found the Yeti. So <laughs> it was actually like an absolute nightmare. I was really hoping that I wouldn't find anything because uh, then I'd become like David Icke going, I swear it's true. Um, <laughs> but it was more like a mission to go to these places because there's just something interesting about the, 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 the people's love of the interest and in that these things exist and the people that hunt these things are just mental and it's just, it was great, it was an adventure really. So I went off and I did, you know, I took photos of what I think were Yeti footprints. There's certainly something in the Himalayas, you know, whether it's a some sort of monkey or something, but it's not a lost tribe, but there's something there. And then I found weird things. I got a plaster cast of the very first Bigfoot cast that was made in 1953. I bought that, that's my best holiday memorabilia. And then my third book was uh, Walking Across Lebanon, where I grew up. But because I grew up there in a war, I never really saw the whole country. So it was kind of a way of going back to my youth and stuff. How, how often do you go back to Lebanon? Mm, not that often. Um, probably once every two years sort of thing. But I, I kind of, it's awkward because, you know, we got parts of the family don't speak and it was all awkward for ages. And that's why this book was amazing because for the first time, rather than going back and sort of having to rely on seeing my dad or stuff like that, this was about me. So I just went off and had my own adventure rather than, you know, it was always like my family's place and I grew up and they were like... D does it not feel like home to you in any way? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's very weird. Like when I grew up, it did feel like home because it was home. Uh, and then there was a certain period of time where I've just lived in England longer than I lived in Lebanon. So... And I've always been English anyway, so it's kind of weird. But when I went back, I feel very at home now. I love it. I love the chaos of it. You know, compared to where I grew up, where I ended up, Cheltenham. When I was a kid, my granny lived in Cheltenham. And I used to leave the sort of amazing craziness of Lebanon, go to Cheltenham. And it was like a fucking old age home, you know. Like, and I just thought, if I live here, I'll kill myself. And then I'm there. So I think I've tried subconsciously to give my kids the stability that I didn't have. So I've just put them in the dullest place in England. How did you feel when you heard about the, uh, the uh, Beirut explosion recently? Well, that was unbelievable because that happened in the port and my family company since 1880s worked in that port. My sister's office overlooks that building, the silo. The office got completely destroyed, completely wiped. Your sister's office? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, 900 meters from where wow. the explosion was. Luckily she was in the house above Beirut saw the thing happen. I mean, it was astonishing. And what was particularly astonishing was Lebanon is so used to explosions and disasters and tragedies. And for this to actually happen and it not be a military thing, but just the sign of the new problem of Lebanon, which is just total corruption and just inefficiency, which is why that stuff was left there. And in the end, it was set off by someone soldiering. You know, Lebanon, I kind of love the chaos of Lebanon. I love the fact there's no speeding tickets. You don't you ignore traffic lights, you can park where you want. It's kind of a cowboy country, really. You don't pay taxes. You know, you just look after yourself. And I kind of love that part of me. But then part of me loves the order and the peace of England. So I kind of grew up with both those. So we spoke, we spoke a little bit um, today about uh, about making mistakes. And I know that last, last night when you and I first met, we were, we were talking about mentorship and kind of continual learning and, you know, I guess a, a career of mistake, mistakes made. What, what, um, what kind of, uh, I guess, what are the big mistakes that, that, you know, we've spoken about money, obviously. You know, How long have you got? <laughs> it's interesting because I think, obviously, uh, you know, you learn the most from mistakes. I mean, no question. And uh, you need to make mistakes because that's how you learn. And if you're not making mistakes, then you're not probably doing anything very interesting. But for me, what I lacked was mentoring, actually, in, in two ways. I'd love to have had a, a savvy manager or an accountant, you know, to look after the business side because I'm shit at business. Uh, and I would have liked to have had if I was a stand-up comedian, I could have gone to other stand-ups, older stand-ups, you know, and learned the ropes and stuff. But because what I was doing, I mean, it's not like I invented Hidden Camera. I didn't in any way at all. But there was no one doing what I did. I wasn't going to go and see fucking Jeremy Beadle. So there was no one I could talk to uh, when I started who would say, you know what, this is, you know, I see what's happening here. Be careful this doesn't happen. I'd love to have had a mentor about fame. I found fame just awful, didn't agree with me at all. Uh, there's an expression that fame is a mask uh, that eats away, eats away the face behind it, which is, it's a very weird thing, fame. I kind of enjoyed the fame because it allowed me to do the things I wanted to do. It opened doors for me. But I hated the sort of, this feeling that suddenly you're public property and that 
you owe anyone an explanation for what you're, you know, being judged, really, I suppose. So I felt very uncomfortable with that. So it's weird. I, I, Trick Happy was so big, I didn't even realise how big it was. And actually, I was mu my wife reminds me of how unhappy I was <laughs> when it was that big. So, well, how long have you been with your wife? Uh, luckily, I married her six months before Trigger Happy happened. So, okay. yeah. Phew. So, I knew that it wasn't for that. Uh, but, yeah. No, so she's very good with that. She, she, lo she loved the, the, the true squirrel in you, not, not the famous squirrel. No, she's Canadian, <laughs> so and she's the nicest person out. So, basically, I can be very defensive and aggressive. And I think when people meet my wife, they think, oh, gosh, she's nice. He can't be that bad. And she's Canadian, so she apologises to everyone literally like everywhere we're driving she goes sorry sorry like she's just totally nice she's the total opposite of me but i think she sees in me the th deep down a sort of rebel canadian like you know she'd love to just say the things i say occasionally so you know we kind of it works like that so obviously i know you've said that you know you wish you had had mentors along the years i mean have you found yourself mentoring anyone else well, it is interesting. So, as I said, it would have been really useful. Like, I'd loved it if there was a rule book, like a guidebook, you know, like these are the things classic, you know, musicians sort of do have that, you know, as, as if you're in a band, you can read any fucking autobiography and you can see the things that go wrong and stuff like that. But there was no one and, and there was no one doing what I was doing. And so one of the nice things, I mean, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a mentor, but there are quite a few people that seem to do hidden camera-ish comedy or pranks I hate the word pranks, um, online. And a lot of them seem to have been started because they love Trigger Happy. So occasionally they'll contact me and say, have you got any advice? And I always think, fuck, I mean, you know, when you ask me to do this, I'm like, what advice? I mean, I've blagged my way through the whole thing. And, uh, you know, my advice is learn from your mistakes. Don't do things for the money. Do what you love. Keep complete control over everything. Don't get lazy and like, let it go. You've got to just, it's got to be your thing because otherwise no one else is going to care as much as you do. But I don't know. It's just all blag in the end. I think uh, my favorite expression in show business is by uh, Albert Goldman, who's a screenwriter. And he, it was supposed to be his dying words, which was nobody knows anything. And it, it's true. Like everyone is blagging in show business. So just that imposter thing that everyone has where they feel they, sh they don't belong there or they don't know what they're doing. No one knows what they're doing. It's just, you need to accept that you do. And to me, I've realized that in showbiz, there's two types of people. There's the person you come and tap them on the shoulder and you go, come on, son, you've had a good run, but you know, we know you're blagging and they go, oh, well, you got me and they go and they're the nice people. And then the ones you tap on and go, come on, off you go. And they go, what are you talking about? I'm a genius. And they're the cunts. So, you know, and that is, <laughs> that is show business, I'm afraid. Well, talk, talking about talking about blagging, yeah. um, let, let's talk about I'm I'm a celebrity. Yeah. Uh, I mean, how how was it for you when you, when you first went on there, uh, and 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 how I mean how real is the show? Is is it is it as horrific as it looks, or do or do you guys get to sneak sneak off to a, a jungle travel lodge in the? In, no, in it's the so background? funny. Everyone always says that, and uh, if anything, I'm a celebrity is weirder and darker than they make it look. Um, so when I, I mean, one of the, I mean, the real problem when I'm a celebrity is boredom. Like you're stuck under this, there's a sort of parachute canopy over you, which stops some of the rain. But if it rains hard, it comes in the side. And, you know, you see an edited hour a day, but 23 hours a day, you're sitting with people you often don't like with nothing to say. And it's just boredom. But I loved it because it kind of, it was 23 days where I had no, distractions I had no phone I had nothing to do I had nothing to worry about everything was taken care of you had basic food like the food and rice and beans was fine like I lost two stone in there I loved it it was great normally I'd pay masses for that <laughs> all that was absolutely fantastic but the weird thing about I'm a celeb what they don't show you is actually the whole thing is based on the sort of hostage mentality of keeping control over you and keeping you unstable so for instance when i first walked into the camp i was literally having a panic attack it was such a head fuck you know you'd seen this place so many times i'd watched the show and suddenly you're like oh my god i'm literally it's like i'm walking in on this show and i'm having a panic attack and i'm i'm live on telly and i'm trying to control it and i feel so out of place you know i'm just like what am i doing everything is a shock you know these people are controlling you they've just put me in a shed overnight with spiders i hate spiders i'm out i'm tired i'm in I hate the place. And then what's weird about the human brain is within two days, you adapt so quickly 
And then that's why they do this thing that hostage takers often do. They move you around. They keep you blindfolded and stuff. So they suddenly go, you're going off to Snake Rock. And you suddenly realize that you love this camp. This is your home. <laughs> and you don't want to go there. So although when it, you watch the show and you think, oh, it gives a shit. It's incredible. Like, you really, you're attached. It's like a, you know, you, you don't want to leave there. Also, when you go out, I mean, just when you watch Ant and Deck interview you, uh, they've got tape over their watch. And I ask them, why have you got tape over their watch? They go, because time is a luxury. I go, what? What are you fucking <laughs> talking about? When you get taken off to a trial that's far away, you get in what I call Beirut buses. They black out Land Rovers. And you get put in the back like a hostage. I mean, it's really weird, the whole... You know, it's quite creepy, because they want you to feel... Because sometimes you can see how people overreact, and you're watching the telly, you think, come on, dude, like, you know, get over yourself. But the stress they put on you subtly, they know what they're doing. It's very interesting. I'd be a good hostage now. So I was, I was going to say, I mean, do you, do you think they use those hostage tactics you know, d d deliberately to get the, to get the outcome and, and, oh, call, and cause I, maximum stress? 100%. I mean, of course they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very thought through. Who, did you know any of, the other, any of the other celebs going into the show or anyone you made particularly? No, very weirdly, I'd met Jenny Eclair. I don't know any comedians. I don't hang out with comedians. I don't find comedians very interesting, actually. Uh, but I had weirdly bumped into Jenny Eclair in the Groucho, because I'm a media cunt. And, uh, and she just came up to me and said, hello, I'm Jenny. And I was like, oh, hi. And, you know, like, I don't like talking to strangers, but I said hello. And then we had no idea. And then literally three weeks later, I'm in a helicopter with her being dropped into the fucking rainforest. <laughs> and uh, actually, I love Jenny. Like, Jenny is still one of my best friends. And uh, that was amazing. Sean Ryder I was in with, and I really, you know, I was a big Happy Mondays fan. And Sean was very quiet for the first three days. And then he just came out of himself. And he's, he's one of the most... If I ever have to describe that term emotional intelligence or like street smart, he is fucking sharp. I love Sean. He's really funny, kind, lovely. So he was good. And then there were some fucking weirdos. I mean, Britt Eklund was in there. I mean, God, how cool is that? Britt Eklund, she's married to Rod Stewart, Peter Sellers. The story she could tell. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, she was nice, but yeah. And then my favorite was Nigel Havers. Now, I think I last saw Nigel Havers in Chariots of Fire, but he's a proper fucking actor. He won an Oscar and stuff. He's one of these people, I'm a celeb works. What you really want is someone who has an, inf I'm not saying Nigel Havers does, but someone who is unself-aware. So someone who thinks there's something, but all the viewers are going, you're so not that. So they're unself-aware, but even better, someone who hasn't seen the show. Oh my God. Nigel Havers had been asked to do the show. His wife had said, do it. So he did it. He'd never seen it. I came in late. So when I arrived in, in, into the jungle, I was picked up in a helicopter this is how weird my life is, by Sean Ryder and Nigel Havers. Yeah. <laughs> so I get in a helicopter and we take off and Nigel Havers, Sean Ryder's like, all right, you know, you know and we, I was going, what's it like? You know, he's going, it's all right. And Nigel Havers has just got a thousand yard stare. Like he doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> and I go, oh, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, have you seen the show? I go, yeah, of course I've seen the show. Go, so you know all about it? I go, yeah. He goes, it's monstrous. It's monstrous. <laughs> I go, no, it's absolutely fine. And so from then on, he sort of saw me as like, I knew what was going on. So, <laughs> like, there was a, you know, they go, tomorrow you'll go into the tunnel of doom. He goes, what is it? What, is it? what do you think it is? I go, well, probably going to be buried and they're going to pour a whole lot of cockroaches on you. What? <laughs> and he just literally, everything was like, he didn't have a clue. And then it ended up, fantastically, in this big trial we all had to go to, which was a court trial. So they'd set up this docks and then there was a kangaroo judge, you know, this sort of shit. <laughs> so we're all put in these docks. The first thing they do is they clip what they claim is an electric sensor to you. And they said, when you get a question wrong, give me an electric shock. Now, I've made enough telly to know that sadly you can't electrocute people, otherwise I would have done. So I knew what it was. <laughs> it's one of those things that just kind of gives you yeah. a buzz. Nigel Havers, of course, doesn't know that. He <laughs> thinks we're gonna be fine. So the first thing I do is I point like that and I pull one off me. So it's not gonna give me a shock at all, so I'm fine. But Nigel Havers is going mental <laughs> and he gets out of his dock and he rips this thing off and he walks outside. <laughs> and it's just one of the weirdest moments of my life. I'm standing next to Sean Ryder and Britt Eklund. We're in a fucking rainforest. There's a sort of extra dressed as a kangaroo who's the judge. And outside you can just hear Nigel Havers screaming at the producer, I will not be electrocuted. This is <laughs> monstrous. <laughs> and you're just like, how ah, the fuck did I end up here? But it was amazing. It was great. I loved it. Uh, w would, you, would you like to do something like that again then? I've done everything. I, weirdly, you're not supposed to do reality shows, but A, I love reality shows. In a sense, they're very similar to what I do because they're improvised, they're real. 
proper comedians, stand-ups and stuff, fear those shows because they hone their craft, they get a really good show, they know what they're going to do. Whereas I only thrive in ad-libbing. I hate scripts. I love ad-libbing. So actually, reality shows are really good for me. So that's one of the reasons I did I'm a Celeb, because I, I just love having to be on the spot and make people laugh and blah, blah, blah. Having said that, I've, I've chosen some... I've, I find it very difficult to say no to things, because it's like a sort of... It's a FOMO thing, you know, I don't want to miss out. And because of that, I've done some truly terrible things. I think the worst is Splash. Now, when it was pitched to me, it was Tom Daly. That's the swimming thing, isn't it? Tom Daly is going to teach you to high dive. Now, there was logic to this. Like, every summer I go to Canada, i got a house on the lake, and there's a big cliffs. And ev I love diving off cliffs and jumping off cliffs. It's what I do with my kids. And every time I'm doing it, I'm the man. Some little fucking 16-year-old turns up, just pushes me out of the way and does a triple flip and goes in. And I'm like, fuck you. And suddenly I thought, God, Tom Daly can teach me this. And then I can do this at the cliff. So I thought, this is great. I, you know, I'm, I can dive already, but I want to learn to do tricks. So for every day, I do this four-hour trip to Essex every day where this Olympic high dive is. There's no sign of Tom Daly. Tom Daly turns up about twice. The whole thing was just an absolute nightmare. I ended up with Arge from The Only Ways Essex and... I can't remember. Were you on the one with Caprice? Yes, and Caprice. She, 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 she was on this show last year. Yeah. And, and she actually talked about Splash and, t and t told us how she actually conceived during Splash. Well, not with me, so sadly. <laughs> but, uh, my, 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 my abiding memory was we were all in a caravan before, like a sort of green room, and Joey Essex was on it. I don't think I've ever met a stupider man than Joey Essex. <laughs> but anyway, we ended up having to get... He locked himself in a loo... And he couldn't work. He was trying to push and it was a pull. That literally was it. And he took about 10 minutes trying to get out. Anyway, in the practices, I was doing quite well. I was diving. I was the first person to dive off the 10 metre board. I was absolutely fine. It was all good. And I thought, I'm going to fucking nail this. I even rang a friend. I said, you know what? You might want to just put a little bit of cash on me. Because <laughs> no, I was supposed to be the joke, you know. And, but I was really, I was not bad. And so then I remember it. It's like this terrible, oh, it's terrible anxiety dream. So the show started. It's live. And I start climbing up the 10 meter board and I get up the top and I think it's Vernon K is at the top with the crew. And all I remember is like, I've just got to get to the edge. And the big secret is don't dive out, dive up and then down, you know, like, and anyway, all this stuff's going through my head and I know what I'm going to do. Cause if you hit badly, you can rip your arm out at 10 meters, you know, and, <laughs> and Vernon K gives me an interview and I haven't ever seen it. I don't dare to, but it's just, he's like, so Dom, how are you feeling? I go, yeah, I'm absolutely fine. And I'm not even thinking. And I go, right, thank you. I can't do that. But anyway, and I get to the edge and I just launch off and literally I can remember myself in slow motion. I'm thinking, holy shit, I'm actually turning around. I'm going to land from the 20 meter board or whatever on my back. And I'm desperately trying to, it's just awful. Everything's wrong. Because in my mind, I'd done a perfect dive and the whole crowd applauds. I hit the water. It's so much pain. I can't tell you. I come up and my daughter and, and wife are in the audience and they're normally like, but they just couldn't lie. They were just like, holy shit. It was so awful. And then I just got sort of dragged out. It was just the worst, worst thing ever. It was terrible. But you made it sound fun. Well, it was an experience. I mean, it, you know, all these things are fun. You know, it's like being a travel writer. I love traveling. Yeah, I love having a great time going to an amazing hotel, hanging out. But it's pretty dull. Like, I can't write about that. So one of the joys of being a travel writer is actually you've got to embrace things going wrong. So worst case scenario when I'm a travel writer, I go and have an interesting trip and it's fun. Doesn't make a good book, but it's fun. Best case scenario, everything goes wrong. Normally, that's a nightmare on your holiday. But for me, the more it goes wrong, as long as I live, it's going to make great copy. So, you know, embrace the, embrace the madness. Just going back to uh, I'm a Celeb, by the way, I mean, yeah. do, do, do you think it was tougher in the Australian jungle than it will be for the guys in the Welsh castle? I don't know. Castle just looks like a fucking cross between Country File and the Crystal Maze. It just doesn't work. I mean, I've done a way, way, way worse show than that. I did uh, The Island with Bear Grylls, and that was, that's the most hardcore thing I've ever done in my life. Dropped off in an island in the Panam Ar archipelago off Panama, and for two weeks, just with nothing. And I got just eaten alive. I've got a shot of my leg, which just looks like it's gangrenous. And uh, I lost three stone on that one in two weeks. I didn't eat a single thing for the whole time. We had nothing. Couldn't catch anything. We, we had a day where we were taught to use bamboo to build furniture and stuff. We get on the island, there's no bamboo. Um, we were told to look for yucca, which is like a weird looking thing. But if you dig it out, it's got a kind of root vegetable. 
I finally found some yucca, brought it back to the camp. I was like, yes, we boiled it, we ate it. It wasn't yucca, it was wood. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was, we, were, we were just a disaster. But that, that's the most, that's the hardest thing I ever did. I remember being in there and thinking, fuck, what would I give to be in the I'm a Celeb camp? That would have been like an 1830 holiday. How many of there was you on the island? Mm, ten. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, did you have to work together as a team? Yeah, you did. And that was the problem. I mean, they were lovely, but there were quite a lot of reality lots, you know, Anyways, Essexes and Made in Chelsea's, and they were lovely, but they weren't my. They, they were nice actually, and they were much more impressive than I was probably on the island. But I just had nothing. They, there was no banter, camaraderie, or whatever. Well, there was no banter, but I just I need someone smart to have a chat with, really. Like, and in the jungle, I was really lucky. Jenny was incredibly smart. I mean, did those kind of guys struggle to um, get involved in the teamwork aspect? Of actually, the not. No, I mean, weirdly, the people that. Everyone thought it would be, you know, the moment I see Ollie Locke from Made in Chelsea and Lydia, God, I can't remember their names anymore now. Lydia something from uh, The Anyways Essex. I don't know what is going on in my tummy. I'm sorry about this. Um, I think it's the thought of the island. Uh, you know, the moment you see them, you think, well, they're just going to be right. Prince, prince and princesses not doing anything. But no, they got totally stuck in. They were brilliant. I, was, I just was terrible. But, you know, again, it's an amazing experience just to know that you can, uh, the, the funny thing about the island was two people that went on. One was a guy, uh, one was uh, in JLS, the singer in JLS, and another was Tom, oh, I'm terrible with names, but he's now going out with that woman on <laughs> Popeye on. Anyway, he's, they were both like gym bunnies, and uh, yeah, he was an ex-rugby ex, um, player. The other guy's a gym bunny. They're like, can't wait to take their shirts off. They, we get onto the island, they're macheting their way through, and we're like, fucking hell, these guys are going to kill it. And what's hilarious is like about 24 hours in, they had zero body fat. Within about 24 hours, they were both just like this. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the guy from JLS left after two days. He, he called us all in and announced that he'd realised that he was wasting his time here. He should be in the studio making music. And I couldn't resist. As he got on the boat and left, I was like, bark, bark, bark. <laughs> <laughs> And then the... the, the, the uh, Rugby player was amazing. He's one of those people, he was like an Olympian. He just didn't want to give in, but he literally couldn't move. He just had no reserves at all. And after about the fifth day, we had to sort of tell him to leave. But he was lovely. But it made me realise that it, when you look at the world of survival, there's Ray Mears and there's Bear Grylls. Ray Mears, you know, he's got some reserves. I think Ray Mears would do better. I mean, when you're doing these reality shows... Yeah, I mean, they're not reality. Well, I was going to say, how often are you aware of the cameras? Uh, you know, how, I mean, how much do people play up to them? You know, is, is it a game? It's really odd, that, because one of the things everyone always says on those shows is, oh, someone's playing a game here. And you're like, you know, any concept you might have of playing a game or being something else, it's like, I don't know, it's like being with a girlfriend, isn't it? Like the first two days, you're all on your best behaviour and something, <laughs> and then someone farts and then... The real, you, you can't keep it up, do you know what I mean? So, I mean, not keep it up, but you know, you can't keep, <laughs> and uh, probably that as not, well. not for two days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but basically, all that's bollocks, because no one's got plans like that. But definitely people play to camera, and there's, there's stuff where you just know people are being false, but you can, you can smell it a mile off, sort of thing. I mean, it's weird, because when I'm on it, I'm a kind of, when I'm on reality shows, I'm a sort of, I'm a hyper version of myself. I'm not not being me, but I'm not stupid. Like, I'm aware that there's a camera, and so stuff that I'd say with a mate that we'd understand totally, you're so aware that could sound wrong. So you, you're vigilant, unless you're an idiot. And there are a lot of idiots. <laughs> so, what, so what's next? What, uh, what, what have we got to look forward to? Well, because I'm hungry and desperate, I thought, <laughs> and I've been in lockdown, I thought, fuck, I really, really need to do some work and you know get stuff in the bank. And it's been brilliant, because lockdown, I've never written, the one thing I've never done before, because I've made everything up and improvised everything, I've kind of felt that's my juju, that's my like, that's what makes me work and I don't want to change it, you know. And everyone goes, oh, you should write a script. I go, no, 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 not a script, I just make it up, you know. But the thing is, if you're not flavour of the month, it's very difficult to pitch. Like the way I'd pitch something like Trigger Happy, I've Trigger Happy, I go, guys, got an idea, what is it? I go, you just have to trust me on it, it's going to be great. They go, yep, here's a jet, off you go. Now, fuck off, you know, like they won't let me do that. And it's very difficult to get an unscripted thing pitched. So I thought, right, maybe I should write a script, but I don't know how to write a script, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, for the last six months, uh, I wrote a pilot script and I sent it around and Working Title optioned it, which is amazing because they're a proper company. And that gave me real confidence. So now I've written it and I've literally finished it. It's about the 20th draft, finished it this week. 
and it's gone in and it's going to be shopped around in January. So hopefully, I really, really think it's good. Um, but if you never hear from it, then you know that I was wrong. Um, but I think it's good. And if that happens, I'm directing it, writing it, and I'm not the main part, but I'm written a part for myself in that. So I'm going to do that. I'm doing a new book. I've just written a book called Such Miserable Weather for Audible, where I've, uh, having been to 100 countries but ignored England, uh, I did a sort of three-month road trip around England. So it's a travel book around England. Okay. So sort of trying to work out why, why I ended up in Cheltenham. And then um, my new book that I'm just starting is called The Conspiracy Tourist. And I'm going to go and hang out with conspiracy people. I want to take a flat earther and uh, who are just the strangest people on earth who believe that the earth is flat and that Australia doesn't exist and that the flat earth has four corners. And one of those four corners is in Fogo in Newfoundland. So I want to fly a flat earther out to Newfoundland with me. And we're going to go to Fogo and we're going to get a boat and we're just going to head out and one of us is going to be wrong. So that's the kind of premise of the book. But I want to look into all this weird shit of conspiracy theories. Awesome. And I guess for, for anyone watching or listening, they, they can get, get your existing books on, on Amazon, on Google, where, wherever they normally find I read the books. them all on Audible. So, yeah, I, I read all my audio books and they're all on Amazon. And you could just come to my Instagram page or Twitter page where I'll be very rude to you. Which is just Dom Jolly. It is Dom Jolly with one L. Perfect. Well, yeah. Dom, thanks a lot for being here. It's been a pleasure listening to your stories. You've kept me very I'm sure I've really, really helped people with their career. <laughs> Absolutely sure of that. No, no, you, you, you've, had, you've had some great Fuck stories. Fuck around till you're 30, dress up as a squirrel, have a nervous breakdown. Bang. <laughs> Make a load of money yeah. and spend it. <laughs> and buy a biplane. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, learn, and learn to fly um, yeah, a hot air balloon. <laughs> Guys, in all seriousness, Dom has had some fantastic nuggets of wisdom and some great stories. So I hope you've enjoyed listening as much as I've enjoyed talking to him. As always, if you like it, make sure you press like. If you don't subscribe already, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Or if you're listening to this on audio, get over to the YouTube channel. And if you don't know about iTunes, Spotify, and all the other places you can listen to your podcast, make sure you follow me over there too. I'm the Matt Haycox on all my social, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>